I thought you said we were having four songs today. Uh, pull your leg. Did I miss a song or something? I mean, no. <laughs> said you said she pranked you. Yep. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. You know, I say it all the time, yep. that the more, I love you guys, really, I love you guys, the more I study the Word, the more I realize how great our God is, and how little, how little I know, and that's what I'm getting ready to say now, how little I know. And how much I have to grow, and I cannot comprehend his love. You know, is because remember last week that we talked about the awesomeness of God. Now, if you weren't here last week, you know, we were studying in the Psalms, and it was saying how all of the oceans he measured out in his hands, and the Nations, all of the nations of the world were like dust on a scale and he could and he could blow it off. And then when you think of it says he just stretched out the curtain of the stars with the span of his hand. And you say, you know, how many trillions? And we talked about how big our galaxy is. And we didn't say how big our universe is. But when you stop to think. Uh, here is this great God that did all of this, made all of this. Why did he make it? And just like when we talked about the experience of baking a cake. You know, you put this ingredient, you measure this ingredient, and you put it all together and it comes out and it's really good, hopefully. Of course, I baked one one time and it fell, you know, but I ate it anyway. But... Uh, here, God had measured out the water, measured out the dirt, measured out the atmosphere. And it's such a delicate balance that if we get that out of any balance, whether in the water is polluted or the trees and things are burned up, that, you know, we could get too close to the sun or too far away. We could scorch ourselves and be burned up or we could freeze to death. But God made this for you. And for me to enjoy all of these things. And then when we messed it up, Adam and Eve, especially in the garden, then he had this plan all along. So his knowledge is infinite. We cannot fully understand. And so it said before the foundations of the world, he had this master plan that we, even though we were going to fall and sin, we were going to need a savior, and he made preparation for that, that he himself was going to die for us. You know, it says that he was crucified before the foundations of the world, and we were in him before the foundations of the world, in God the Father's mind. Now, I want to talk about Psalms 110, and I want you to see... Not only how awesome he is, but how eternal he is. Now, it's easy for us just to take the psalm and read it and say, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on the right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And you say, Nothing big deal about that. The Lord said unto my Lord. But this is David talking. And it was promised to David that someone from his lineage was going to sit on the throne and rule forever. And so if he's going to sit on David's throne and rule forever, it has to be someone that's going to be eternal. But it's got to be someone that's from his line. And so the New Testament tracks all these generations back to David and back to Abraham and all the way back to Adam. And so here this is really saying, Jehovah God, the Father, said unto Adonai, the Son. You know, these are two words, you know, 
God is all one, but he's got three distinctive persons in him. And it says here, the Father is saying to the Son, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now David, even though he was a king, he was also a prophet. You know, because here he prophesied what happened. Now when Jesus came, he died on the cross. This is assuming it has already happened, even though it hasn't happened yet. But it's going to happen in the future. It's because Jesus right now is at the right hand of God, sitting there until all of these enemies are made his footstool. And if you go back to Psalm 2, you know, Psalm 2 talks about all of the nations, why are they in distress? Why do they think they can overthrow the plan that I have for the universe? He says, I will laugh and I will have them in derision. And then he says, you know, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And he says that he is going to rule the universe. You know, and here God is saying, don't worry, I'm going to send a savior down there. He's probably going to have a lot of difficulty because everybody's going to be against him and they're going to eventually kill him and persecute him. He says, but you know, that he is going to rule and he is going to reign. It says here, now Christ we know has already been crucified. He's already been raised and resurrected. He's sitting on the right hand of the Father. And now the Father is working all things out where he is going to eventually come in great power and great glory. Now, here he says in... Uh, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, here, this is David, and David knows the cultures of that day, is that when a king went against another king, and they did battle, and one king won, they would take the other king, if he was dead or alive, and make him lie down, and they'd put their foot on him, and like, yes, I did it, victory, you know. And that's what he's saying here. All of the nations of the world, all of the kings of the world are going to gather together against my anointed one. And they think they're going to be the winners. And he said, no. He said, I am going to make all of these your footstool. And so then he says here, the Lord sent a rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Now, here it says, The Lord shall send a rod of thy strength out of Zion. Now, over in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 6, and I think it's about verse 14, it says that here is going to be a rod of Jesse that's going to come and is going to rule the people. And it says he is going to be a king and he's going to be a priest. Now, this is important. I don't want to lose you here. Now, the whole purpose of the priesthood, when, you know, through uh, Jacob had the 12 sons, and he said, okay, <coughs> Moses and Aaron, they were going to be, uh, Aaron was going to be a high priest, and the tribe of Levi was supposed to be the priest that made the offerings, you know, the people made the offerings, the priest represented the people, to God by presenting the offering to God. And then if God accepted that offering, then the priest went back to the people and gave that ironic blessing. It says, you know, that may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. That ironic blessing. Well, eventually, the priesthood became corrupt. Okay? And so, he, the Lord, brought about prophets. He raised the prophets, you know, to be a spokesman for him to the people. So now you have the priests represent the people to God, and now the prophets are receiving word from God, talking to the people. Now the king is supposed to be down here reigning and ruling righteously. Okay? Now, 
Here, Jesus, when he came, he is going to fulfill all of those offices. He's going to be a prophet, he's a priest, and he is a king. Yeah. Now, this got him in a lot of trouble with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious rulers of the day. And he says here in verse 3, The people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. You say, what in the world does that mean? It's a, but he says here, the people who have accepted Christ as the Savior, even the Old Testament people who didn't know yet that Christ was dead on the cross, but they knew they had to make restitution for their sins, they brought these sacrifices, and these sacrifices were accepted as a covering until the true sacrifice, Jesus, comes along. And so then, here, he says, Thy people. Now, anyone who has accepted Christ as Savior since Jesus died on a cross, and those that believed and hoped that he was coming, like Abraham, it said that Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And so the law came later on, about 500 years later or more, and the law was not able to save people the law to show them, as it says over in the New Testament, the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ to know that there's no way we could keep all of these. He said, even if you think something wrong in your mind, you're guilty of sin. So that's the sin nature in us. And he says, so when Christ came, Christ had to be fully man and fully God. Because, you know, here's God sitting up there in his throne, and it says, he is almighty, he is all-powerful, he is a spirit. You know, how does he know hurt? Has anybody twisted his arm behind his back? He didn't know hurt. And has anybody ever punched him, like punch in the wind? You can't hurt God. So, he says in the Old Testament, Jesus said, a body hast thou prepared for me, I come to do thy will, O God. So he had to have a human body in order for him to realize all the hurt and the pain and the agony I go through. Whether I smash my thumb with a hammer or whether it's a divorce or whether it's a death in the family, anything. He had to have a human body to be able to feel all of that pain. And so, that's what it says in the New Testament. He was there in the garden and he was crying, drink sweat blood, you know. And he says, oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. You know, he said, because he knew the agony he had to go through in order to save us. And then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. And when he was on the cross... And he died up there. You know, he said, it is finished. What really means, tell it let's die, means paid in full. That he died for everybody's sin. So anybody could come to him. And that's what he's saying here. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Because he's coming back. After the great tribulation, after the seven year period, he's coming back. As the book of Revelation says, he's coming back with power and great glory and ten thousands of his saints. And so that's the thing that we don't realize that it says here, thy people, that's the believing Jews at that time, as well as all of the Christian believers. And when he comes back, those unbelieving Jews are going to look on him because they're being punished by the Antichrist and they're going to be willing to serve him because the Bible says in Romans that all of the Jewish people, 11, chapters 11, 12, and 13, are going to be saved. 
you know, all at once they're going to look on him whom they have pierced and mourn. Oh, why didn't we see this before? And then he says here, the people will be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness. And then this is really a poetic saying, from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. It's almost like, you know, when a woman gives birth to a child, you have that child, and you say, oh, what a beautiful baby. You know, some of them are, some of them are, <laughs> you know. But he says, what a beautiful baby. But then, that's what it's saying here, like the whole earth, you know, is a womb, and it's going to break forth in a new day. He says, it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and all things are going to be passed away. All things are going to become new. The lamb is going to lay down with the wolf and the lion and all those things. And the desert is going to blossom. He says, it is just like refreshing. All the sin is gone. And we have a Savior who's ruling in righteousness. And we fail to see that sometimes. Then he says here in verse 4. The Lord has sworn... And will not repent. Thou art the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Jesus, when he came here, <coughs> that he was talking to the Pharisees. And uh, they didn't accept him as the Messiah. They didn't accept him as the Savior, the Deliverer, the Anointed One. And so... Jesus said to him one time, he said, what do you think of the Christ? Whose son is he? And the Pharisees, well, he's David's son. And Jesus said, well, if he's David's son, why did David say, the Lord said unto my Lord? Meaning, the Lord was superior to David. And if he was an offspring of David, how could he be superior unless he was greater? And he was greater because he was the son of God. And he was made flesh. You know, and that is the hardest thing for us to grasp. Is you know, that in the Gospel of John, he says that the Word was from the beginning. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the word was made flesh. You know, so it says when the angel told Mary that you're going to have a baby and this holy thing is going to come from the Holy Spirit and you're going to name him Jesus, that he will save the people from the sins. And so here you had the voice of God, which is the word. And then you have the flesh here and they're mingled together into one. That's why he was totally man and he was totally God. And you know when he was about 12 years old and he was in the temple and the priests were saying, you know, he was lost for three days. His parents couldn't find him. And then the priests were amazed at the answers that he gave in his knowledge of the scriptures. But then when you look back and say, well, of course he had the knowledge. He is the Word. He is the one that was made flesh. He is God incarnate. He's the one that gave those scriptures to you. You know, that's hard for us to comprehend. And so then he says that you will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so another time, Jesus was there and uh, he was talking to the Pharisees. And they were talking about we have Abraham as our father. And Jesus said, if Abraham was your father, because Abraham accepted through faith that he was going to be redeemed. He said, if Abraham was your father, you would believe in me. And then he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he said, what? Now we know that you're crazy. Abraham, you're not even 50 years old yet. And Abraham died over a thousand years ago. <clears throat> and he says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he was glad. He said, because before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> oh, when they heard that, they wanted to kill him. 
Because when he said, I am, that is the name of God. When he appeared to Moses and Moses said, who will I say sent me? And he says, tell them, I am has sent you. And he says, I am whatever you need. I am your comfort. I am your health. I am your healing. I am your graciousness. I am your power. I am whatever you want me to be. I am. And so then he thought, well, where does this come in Melchizedek? It says, you can't be a priest and a king because the king comes from Judah, from the line of Judah, the line of David, into the kingship. And they traced, you know, <laughs> Jesus' genealogy back through Mary and through Joseph. And both of them go back to David. But it wasn't the seed of Joseph. It was the seed of God. And so, and the blood of the woman never mixes with the blood of the child. And so it's man and God represented there. And then they said, Melchizedek, it says, see, the Jews thought you have to be a Levite to be a priest. And they didn't realize that there was another priest, if they would have known the scriptures like they think they do, they would go back, because back in the book of Genesis, before Abraham's name was changed, it was Abram. And God had talked to Abram back then and said, get away from your family, get away from all your relatives and go somewhere and I will make you a great nation. And Abraham did it. But Abraham's brother died and he had a son named Lot. And so he took Lot with him. The process of time went on. Abraham became very wealthy. And so, and then Lot became very wealthy. And Lot decided, they said, well, Lot's going to go down here by Sodom and Gomorrah because he had a lot of sheep and wanted to feed them. And Abraham said, wherever you go, I'll just go the opposite so we won't be clashing with each other. Well, eventually, his name hadn't been changed yet. He doesn't have any offspring. And so there are five kings from up north, way up there about 150, 200 miles away, these five kings decide they're going to go down and fight against these four kings down here in Sodom and Gomorrah and a couple of other cities. So they go down and they capture all of these people in Sodom and Gomorrah and they take all of the jewelry, all of the wealth, all of the cattle and all the sheep and take them away. But one person escaped and they went and they told Abraham that your nephew, Lot, was taken captive by these people from up north. Let me turn back there to Genesis chapter. You don't have to turn there, but I just want to turn and let you see something. And then you might get a whole different picture of uh, who Abraham was. Okay, and here it says that in verse 14 of chapter 14. And when Abram heard that his brother, they call him brother, anything that was a relative was a brother usually, it says that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Now you have to remember. Sodom and Gomorrah is down here by the Dead Sea. The nation Dan was way up here in the north, up near Syria and Assyria, and that's over a couple hundred miles. But now, Abraham didn't have any children yet. But it says, these were people who were born in his house, and anything in his house meant anybody was under his employment. And so here, this was 318 men, and they pursued all the way to Dan, and they, they managed to overthrow all of these five kings who had overthrown these kings down here. And it says, and Abraham took all of the spoil and all of the goods back, and he gave them back to the people there in Sodom and Gomorrah and those other towns. 
And here it says up here in verse 17, it says, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him, this is Abram, after his return from the slaughter, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. Then here it is. This little verse, you know what place you see it here? It says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem. Now, Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And then it says, And Salem, king of Salem, which means peace. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. And then he says over here, And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, and I will not take anything for you, not even a shoelace from you, unless you say you made me rich. You know. But what I want you to see is that here, Melchizedek is a priest of the Most High God. Now, <laughs> that's what they were saying back here in the New Testament. It says, have you seen Abraham? And he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he was glad. What do you mean you saw Abraham? He said, before Abraham was, I am. Meaning, <laughs> I was the one who brought the wine and the bread to Abraham to bless him. And you see, you see that, that this was what they call either a Christophany or a Theophany, meaning it was God or Jesus in human form. Not that he had a physical body, but he could appear. And then after this, several times that God had appeared to Abraham, because remember he appeared to Abraham with two other angels, and he said he was on his way. He heard the moaning and groaning of Solomon and Gomorrah. This was later. And then he, then he said, God said to Abraham, I'm not going to lie to you what I'm going to do. I'm going down there and see, and I might have to destroy him, that he's going to wipe him out. And that's when Abraham said, oh, my Lord, he said, if there's 50 righteous people, will you spare it? And he said, yeah, I'll spare it for 50. Then he went, how about for 40? Would you spare it for... He said, yeah, I'll spare it for... And he gets all the way down. And he came down to 10. And he thought, oh, Lord. You know, Sodom and Gomorrah. Is there going to be 10? And he realized that Lot's down there. Lot's wife is there. He had two daughters. And then his wife. And he said, how about five? He says, I'll spare it for five. But he couldn't find five because the two daughters' husbands refused to go. You know, they wanted to stay back there. So really, it was only about four. But then when his wife looked back, it was not. She wanted to go back because of the fun they were having. And so it was only three. And God wiped them out because of their wickedness. And then... Here, so we go back over here to, uh, where are we? Psalm 110. He says, so you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, it says that the old priesthood, the Aaron priesthood from the tribe of Levi... They always, that was a, a faultful, sinful covenant, you know, because the priest became so corrupt that they needed correction. That's why he gave the prophets. The prophets went to the priest and said, hey, and anybody could be a prophet if they wanted to. And they were, the prophets became corrupt. So, here... In the New Testament it said, these priests 
did not live forever, and they had to be replaced. So there was a flaw in the priesthood. And even the high priest, now, when Jesus was taken to the high priest, and this is, this is the important thing here. Jesus was taken to the high priest. And they kept on pounding him. And they even had these false accusers come up and say, you know, that he said he was going to destroy the temple in three days and build it back up. And then the high priest said to Jesus, you hear what they're saying about you? You going to answer anything? And Jesus was just quiet, didn't say anything. And the only time Jesus ever spoke to the rulers and the leaders of who he was is when they asked him specifically, like the high priest said, I adjure you to tell us whether or not you are the Son of God. And he said, it is just as you say. Meaning, yes, I am the Son of God. And they said, that's blasphemy because anybody who would be declared the Son of God has to be equal with God. And that's what he was saying. And so the high priest at that time said, what need do we have of witnesses? He said it himself. It's blasphemy. He deserves to die. And the high priest, who had this special robe, has got all the stones that represented all the tribes. He ripped his robe and said, what need do we of anything else? And then a little bit later, a couple hours later, he was put on a cross and he was crucified. And when he was crucified, there was thunder and lightning and the veil in the temple was split down the middle. And then what it was saying is this old priesthood is over. The high priest himself sinned because he ripped the holy garments. And then the curtain that separated the priest from the holiest holy place the curtain was taken away and God says now you can come boldly unto the throne of grace and so that's where we are now at the throne of grace we have this opportunity to tell other people that Jesus loves them he cares for them he died for them and they should repent and accept him as Savior and then he says now Jesus has sat down at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for us and he is a priest that never dies. He died once and for all but never again and he's there to make intercession for us. And he said to the believers, you are a royal priesthood. You are a holy temple. And then also over in the Old Testament in Zechariah says that, you know, the Lord himself will build the temple. Now over in Jerusalem, there's a lot of hoopla about, should we build the temple? Shouldn't we build the temple? Is it up where the mosque is or is it behind the mosque, you know? And everybody wants to build the temple. And then the, the, some of the really strict religious people say, no, the scripture says that God himself will build the temple. And that's the whole thing Jesus and Paul is saying, he said, don't you know you are lively stones? When you accept Christ as your Savior, you're included in this. He says, you are the temple of God. He's building his church. He's building his temple because the Holy Spirit is coming and living in you and changing your life in such a way that you are going to be glorified with him. And that's what it's saying here, that your people shall be willing in the day of thy power. He said, when Christ comes back, after that seven-year tribulation, he's going to rule, and he's going to reign, and we're all going to say, Hallelujah! We're coming back with him, and we're going to be kings and priests unto God. But then he says here, in verse 5, The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen, and he shall fill the places with dead bodies. <coughs> he shall wound the heads over many countries. He will drink of the brook. In the way, therefore, shall he lift up the head. You know, what he's saying here is that people here on earth 
have had so many, many opportunities to trust in God. But more and more and more, they're becoming more wicked, more secluded, and more anti-Christian, more anti-church, more anti... And even we can see it. And I have an article that I got out of the paper last week. It's about artificial intelligence. You know, and we have become so engrossed in our smartphones and our little things that, like Siri and uh, I forget what the other one is that Alexa. you just... Huh? Alexa. Alexa. Alexa, order me a pizza. Okay. Alexa, to start the car and warm it up. You know, we're so involved in technology. This article was saying people don't have to read anymore. They don't have to learn anything anymore because they can push a button and ask a question and get the answer. And then at the end of the article, it said it won't be long before there are computers that are going to be in a room teaching people how to think. Think of that. There will be a computer in a room teaching people how to think. It's because we have become so lazy in our mind. And then we're saying how they're going to even have these little computers that you can wear on your arm or wherever. It's going to tell you when your blood pressure is too low or it's too high. And even if there's something that you need a certain medication. I mean, it's phenomenal what can happen in technology. So when they talk about the Antichrist and the beast, and they're going to make an image of the beast who can talk and shoot fire out of his mouth, you know... It's going to come. And so he's saying here, these people have had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, but they've become so hard in their hearts that they refuse. And all through the book of Revelation, through the different bowl judges, the vow judges, and the trumpet judges, you know, they're still, they're going to hide themselves in the rocks and they'll say, fall on us! And... Keep us from whom we have to do because they're going to see the face of God in His glory. And that's why it behooves us. So this little short ten or seven chapters here, it says there's going to be kings and people and dead bodies in the valleys. And it says during that great tribulation and that final battle of Armageddon, the blood is going to run for a couple of hundred miles up to the bridle of the horse. And we feel... We can't fathom that. How deep that's going to be because all of these people are against God. And so our persecution time is coming. You look at all these other nations that used to be strong in religion over in Germany and also over in Great Britain. And then we're an offspring of Great Britain. And look at France and all of those people over there. The churches are being destroyed. The people are being persecuted. And even over in China now. But there's an underground movement. And there's torture. We just don't see it in our news. But it's coming here. And we can see the unrest that we have in our government now. And the time is going to come. Where we're either going to say. Yes I am a believer. Or no I don't believe in all that stuff. You know so we have to be sure. That's what Paul and Peter are saying. Make fast your confession. Know what you believe and know why you believe it and stand for what's right. You know, and this is, it's hard. You know, it's hard, but it's coming. And the Lord says that He wants all of us to be faithful to the end. And so that was just a short psalm, but there's so much in there because. It assumes that the Lord has already come, and He's already come. It assumes that He's sitting down at the right hand of the Father. David wrote all of this before he was even thought about, you know. And then over here, it talks about Melchizedek being the high priest, and it's probably a theophany or a Christophany, whatever one you want to choose, of God appearing 
as though he were a person, you know, and when he came, he came as a person. And then it says here, all those dead bodies. And I pray to God that it won't be any of my relatives. But I'm sure there are some of my relatives who have already died. And they're already on their way to the bottomless pit in the lake of fire. And so it behooves us to pray for our loved ones. And that's one thing. I, this, and I'll close with this. The power of prayer. The power of prayer to change people's lives. And I know that we say, oh yeah, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. And a lot of times we do say a little prayer here and there. But a lot of times, like missionaries will be on the mission field and they might be facing a crisis that you're not aware of. And all of a sudden you'll say, I never thought about Charlotte and Dallas before. I never thought about Bill and Kathy for a long time. And I'll say, Lord, this is just bless them out there. And then all of a sudden I'll find myself really praying hard for them. And then realize later on, they went through some real struggles, you know. And... I could tell you story after story. And so your prayers, you know, even here in this room, let me tell you, there are so many frequencies out there, radio frequencies, wave frequencies, light frequencies that we're not aware of. And it says there are angels out there. And all of us have angels that are supposed to be supervising, taking care of, whatever. And so they don't, or they are not limited by physical things. They could be in this room right now. But there are also demons. There are wicked spirits. It could be in this room right now. And they can travel at the speed of thought. Now, if you stop to think of David, well, not David, Daniel, when he was taken captive over into Babylon, and that he said that... Uh, he had fasted and prayed, and he was doing that for 21 days. And then the angel came and said, you know, Daniel, it says, from the time you started to pray, that I was sent here on a message to tell you that your prayer has been answered. He said, but I had a fight against the prince of the uh, Persians over there. And he says, then he explained it. So there's a warfare that's going on. And we don't know, even in this room, it could be, you know, the angel is whispering something in this ear and the demon is whispering something in this ear, you know, and you say, I got to make a choice here, you know. And that's why it's important for us to realize we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of the darkness. And so it says, he that is in you, meaning the Holy Spirit, is greater than he that is in the world, the evil spirits in wicked angels and things like that and so here there's a lot in that scripture that I'd like to cover but I just didn't have the time but I want you to know next week I'd like to go back to uh, oh and by the way that's a prophetic psalm I'd like to go back to Psalm 109 and talk about 109 109 is is very perplexing so read Psalm 109, and then if you would, Psalm 111, 112. They're very easy reading. Okay, let's stand and pray and be dismissed. <laughs>